um, in the Cordilleras or in the Philippines in general, many of the deposits of the minerals are in indigenous communities and territories. And the Philippines is very much rich in mineral resources. It ranks number five in the global deposit of gold, uh, nickel, and also copper. So you can just imagine, you know, the intrusion of multinational mining companies, trading investments coming in to wanting, you know, to have a piece of these resources. Um, as we all know, uh, the Philippines is the government, both from the local to the national levels, are quite corrupt, and they'd rather favor, you know, the interest of the mining companies and trade and investment rather than to protect and promote the rights of its people, particularly uh, indigenous communities. Um, in, you know, indigenous women have organized themselves to resist and defend, you know, the resources that they have. In many cases, extractivism or resource extraction is accompanied and supported by strong or heavy militarization in the communities. Um, pretty much we see the intrusion of military forces as well as paramilitary forces in these communities. In fact, the Philippine government has legalized you know, the use of paramilitary forces to secure and defend you know, the rights of, of the investors. Uh, there is an executive order number 79, which is called the Investment Defense Force, that is primarily created to, you know, to provide security uh, to these companies. The other, the other uh, activities or strategies that you know, the military in collaboration or in cahoots with uh, the company is using and, and getting into the communities and softening the hearts and minds of the people uh, in their resistance uh, against you know, um, these, these companies coming in, uh, causing food, uh, well, the loss of uh, food resources, the loss of livelihoods, and in many cases, displacement of communities. Um, they, they, you know, um, how do you say that? They try to, not only that they try, but they <coughs> establish relationship, sexual relationship with indigenous women in the communities and when they're time, you know, or their assignment is that the, the women are left with children. The other one is they use rape and coercion uh, to, to get, you know, the, the, not the support, but to, to be able to get in to the communities. And many of these indigenous communities are not able to defend themselves because they don't have the means. Um, so given the situation, um, not only, well, indigenous women, in relationship and also in partnership with the women in the Philippines and in Asia particular, you know, in, in at the regional level. They put up, uh, one is the International Indigenous Peoples Movement for Self-Determination and Liberation. There is a very active network of women in mining in, in, in the region. And there, there's also the Asia Pacific Women and Law and Development that looks into, you know, um, supporting uh, the, the, the struggles of, of, of women through law or using you know, legal, legal means and, and, and the courts. Um, what Beverly would want to, I guess, uh, to emphasize in, in, in this um, conversation, in this forum is one, that international solidarity and building relations among and between affected communities should be strengthened and that we should all be supporting the call for solidarity, particularly those communities that are heavily militarized. Mm -hmm. um, I also would like to emphasize the fact that in this forum, the World Social Forum and other international conversations, not many indigenous women are able to participate because they come from remote communities. They don't have the means, uh, the, the funds to be able to travel and the restrictions, the, the border restrictions that Jennifer mentioned, the visa restrictions, further, you know, marginalizes and, and silence the voice of this organized and resisting uh, group of women. <coughs>